So for those of you that don't know, and I certainly didn't know this when I got into this endeavor, how does a memorial shape an experience and tell a story? There are essentially three different formats that memorials come in, fields, walls, and enclosures. And I'll talk a little bit about each one of those. First of all is fields, and as you see here from the slide, fairly self-explanatory. The example shown here is the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. In the upper left, you'll see the large area of fields. That's approximately three acres. In the bottom left, you'll see those field slabs. As you walk through them, you get the feeling of foreboding, something like it must have felt to be in a concentration camp during World War II and the Holocaust. Walls. This one's self-explanatory. I think we're all familiar with the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. This is the most famous of, of the wall uh, monuments and very self-explanatory. The National Police Memorial in Canberra, Australia. Another very powerful uh, wall format. This honors the fallen police officers in all of Australia. And in the upper left, you'll see how it looks when it's illuminated at night. The third and final genre are enclosures. Here's an example of the Madrid train bombing memorial in Madrid, Spain. It's a subterranean enclosure built at the level that the trains go in and out of Madrid. And then in the middle of this slide, you'll see the a structure that rises up out of the ground. It's a glass enclosure that captures light. And on the inner uh, slide here on the right, you'll see where all the names are ins inscribed of the victims of that event. Here's an example of another type of enclosure. Uh, and this is the Civil Rights Memorial Park in Birmingham, Alabama, and evokes the emotions that you would get if you were on the wrong end of a police dog. A word about inscriptions and all the various ways that inscriptions take place. Here's an example of some other examples of inscriptions, the Kentucky Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Frankfort, Kentucky. On the upper left, you'll see the sundial. In the middle, you'll see the inscriptions. And once a year, on the date that the soldier uh, fell in combat, the shadow of the sundial actually goes over their name. So it's another very powerful way that inscriptions can be used. The Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. This one's bathed in water. People can really have sort of a hands-on experience with those inscriptions, and it's just another way and another format that inscriptions are done. How can firefighters then be best memorialized? There are lots of different ways. We have meaningful symbols to impart a sense of the danger faced by firefighters in the line of duty. We have meaningful symbols that embody the spirit that firefighters are one of us and we have meaningful symbols to incorporate the Minnesota Fire Memorial statue. Meaningful information to honor sacrifices made by firefighters on behalf of all citizens and to recognize the contribution of all fire departments in the state. Everyone has a stake in the game. And to evoke the fact that it's a meaningful occupation. To claim the sacred ground that's been given to us by the legislature belonging to the memorial. To respect the adjacent monuments and also to accommodate a variety of different uses. The site context, this just gives an overview of the site at the Capitol. On the left, you'll see our site, and then there are three different red lines showing what's called the view shed. This image shows the actual site itself with parking lot H to the left of the site, and the dotted line denotes where we will be running our site down to. The parking lots in this example actually give us an advantage because so many of our ceremonies and our events involve our apparatus. So having the parking lots as part of our memorial site actually is a benefit to us. And also in order to keep our costs down, if we were going to take up more of that parking lot, we'd have to move that curb cut. In this slide, we show the architecture and kind of the geometry of the Capitol and showing the focal point of our memorial site in relation to all of the other positions on the Capitol grounds. These lines uh, subdivide the site following the major mall uh, geometries and boundaries. And as you'll see in the next slide after this, uh, how this all lays out for our memorial site. In this slide, we show the zoning, or the lines that establish the north and south zones. And you'll see in the shaded areas, those pie-shaped images, that's to denote how crowds of different sizes would fit into the memorial. The north garden zone and the south plaza zone are established 
by using pavers in one area of the memorial site and some other green space or hardened ground uh, in the northern area. This separates the site and gives the focal point where, uh, for where gatherings would take place. The monolith hovers over the line of paving and landscape over the focal point and creates a formal center. The reason for the monolith is to evoke that feeling that firefighters get when they travel into the unknown. This will provide a shadow over the memorial site and as you'll see the hole in the top of the monolith, otherwise known as an oculus, is where the memorial statue will be positioned. This is simply imagery that shows all the work that our architects, Leo A. Daly, have done to understand how the sunlight, which will be gathered by the oculus and shined down on the memorial statue, will bathe that statue in light. And I'd like to take a minute right now just to talk about our architects, Leo A. Daly. Some of you may have heard of them before. They are very well renowned for their work in memorial design site and they have given us all of their time and energy uh, pro bono or free to the fire service for this project. To date, their billable hours total somewhere in the $60,000 range, but they are not charging the fire service one penny for their efforts. In this slide, we show the column grid. As you'll note here, there are numbers running from left to right on the bottom of the grid and up and down on the right side of the grid. These lines and points on the grid denote years and decades. So across the bottom of the grid are the years and going up the right hand side are the decades. And this is century independent information. So if a firefighter had passed away in 1911, they would be in that spot where the year one grid intercepts the decade 10 grid and that would be 1911. Then if a firefighter had passed away in 2011, as happened just several weeks ago with Firefighter Emker from the Cambridge Fire Department, he too would be memorialized on that same spot on the grid. Here is represented the field of columns. Each of the columns would be a support device for that monolith that I spoke of earlier, and this shows the positioning. If we take the 190 firefighters that have perished in the line of duty since records were kept in Minnesota in 1881, these are the points where those firefighter fatalities took place on this grid system. Note that in some cases there would be more than one firefighter memorialized at any given point. The field then adjusts, leaving a void to create an accessible path. We need to make sure that our site has proper ingress and egress for people of all abilities in terms of wheelchairs, walkers, um, anybody else that visits the site. So you see here that we flex the site to accommodate ease of access. And in the middle, uh, that little square box denotes where the Minnesota Firefighter Memorial statue will be placed. Here shows the sculpture void, just another representation which would show exactly where the sculpture would be placed. The memorial plan then. Here are all the points again represented and the memorial statue. This slide shows the monolith from above and the hole or the oculus and the fact that water will drain to the oculus and drip in a ring around the statue. Here we see a transverse section to give you a good idea about how the monument and the memorial will look from this angle. Here is a transverse section showing the roof capturing the water when charged by rain or in the case of planned events since we're going to be bringing fire apparatus to these events we could charge that roof with a minimal amount of water and create that sheeting of water or that dripping as might be the case for ceremonies and events that we hold at the site. The transverse section showing the water dripping into the covered trench around the statue staining the ground in a certain pattern. The longitudinal section. Here you'll see that we're not only doing the sculpture and the enclosure but also including that wall format that we talked about earlier. And this will follow the line between the garden and the plaza leading visitors directly into the structure. On this slide you'll see a view from the south showing the artist rendition of the wall and the sculpture and the structure. Below where it says dedicated to Minnesota's firefighters, the plan would be to have every fire department's name inscribed in this wall. And note that the material for the entire structure, not including the statue which is bronze, but all other components of the structure are made out of a product called Corten steel. 
Core 10 steel is the product that rail cars are made out of, and it has the interesting characteristic of rusting to a certain point, and then that rust provides and creates sort of a protective coating, making it a lifelong product that doesn't ever degrade. In this slide, we show the detail, an up-close picture of how those support poles would look and the uh, monument in the background, and then on the right-hand side would show that we're going to be engraving each of the support poles with the name of the fallen firefighter. This area would then be waxed or treated in a special way so that it doesn't weather quite as rapidly as the rest of the Core 10 steel, making it easy to find these names within the memorial. They're also being engraved in there so that people can do those rubbings like you see on other inscriptions with other memorial sites. Here then quickly are a couple of different artist renditions of the views, the view from the north and the view from the east with a large crowd gathering for a ceremony honoring Minnesota firefighters who have given their lives in the line of duty. Thank you for watching this presentation. If you have any questions, would like more information, you can contact me at gesbenson at edenprairie.org or go to our Facebook page, Minnesota Fire Service Foundation, and look for more information. Thank you for your time and attention.